Uh, hi, we're uh, coming to you from Northwest Regional ESD in Hillsborough, Oregon, where we are part of a uh, teaching primary sources grant. And uh, let's see if you can see some of the folks out there in the room. There they are, wave folks. See, there they all are. Hello, 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 hello. And uh, on the line, uh, we have Adam Franklin Lyons from um, Marlboro College in Vermont, where he's a historian. Uh, our, uh, our workshop is on uh, the student as historian, and so we're going to begin by just uh, giving Adam perhaps a moment to tell us about what attracted him to history or what it's like to think sure. like a historian. Thanks, Adam. So uh, one little factoid at, at the beginning of all of this, um, I'm actually from Portland, Oregon. I went to Cleveland High School uh, as a teenager, which I, many of you are probably know about, and I lived in that area. And so uh, when I noticed this invitation coming from Portland, I thought, well, that, that's odd. I, wonder, I My first thought is it might have something to do with that, but it turned out not. It was just social media, and here I am. Um, I actually got into doing history by doing music history first. I, I did a fair amount of background in music. Um, and one of the things that when I started doing history through the music is that the music itself is pretty uncertain, um, especially when you go back to doing medieval music. My specialty is medieval Europe. I work on the 14th century now, but the music that I worked on was I did some in the 9th century and some in the 12th century. Um, and the music, the manuscripts that we have, especially from the 9th century, we don't really know how they sound. We have no idea. Um, and so that was my sort of undergrad introduction to the uncertainty of doing history, which is something that I still really enjoy and that I think is part of the key of why we use primary sources to teach. It's one of the things that I definitely notice, and I know that you, you covered this a little bit and, and uh, looked at people like Sam Weinberg, right, thinking like a historian concept, is that when we go to do history, we don't really know what we're going to find, and we can't find out everything. And that, that limit on it is part of what I find really fascinating about doing it. Um, but I do notice when I teach intro history, first-year college, um, and I, uh, the, the conversation that, that Sam has in his article with the 16-year-old is really emblematic of this, is that people want to know what the story is. Well, how, you know, when you give them a document, how am I supposed to understand this? Where does this fit in? But we don't always know that. And in part being a medievalist, I feel like this is really emphasized in medieval Europe where we have the sources we have, not the sources that we want. Um, it's a little different doing 19th, 20th century. You, you still don't have all the sources you want, but you certainly have more. Um, so I do, I do like the, uh, you know, I really, I, that's what I like conveying to students is how uncertain and how little we know. Um, that then gets them asking all of these questions, thinking about what does the source tell us, what are we inferring, what are we guessing from it. Um, and so that, I feel like, is the main thing that I go for. That's what I find most interesting when I read primary sources. I read things that, you know, people have never read. Still in the 14th century, I can open, right now I'm reading letters between people, and I can open a letter that I'm pretty sure nobody's read in 500 years. Um, so we only know what's there because I'm looking at it. And if I'm guessing at something my guess is as good as anybody else's. And that's, that's a fun thing to sort of convey to students and what they're doing. So that's just a few minutes short intro. I'm, I'm happy to go right to questions. <laughs> so, so does anyone want to lead off with a question? Something you're wondering? Oh, come on. OK, I'm going to ask you. Okay, go for it. So one of the difficulties I've had with asking you know, when you're looking at biases and um, things like that in primary documents, I have kids say, eventually when you talk about you know, the difficulty of finding the truth, they just think there is no truth in it all. History sort of becomes pointless because it's all just whatever I think is, is fine. How do you get to 
significance <laughs> of mm. history and some sort of truth in history, um, sifting through all the, the different biases. I guess one of my first responses to that is that, uh, particularly for me in the work that I do, a lot of history and a lot of certainty about things is about aggregation. So you become more certain as you read corroborating evidence. Um, and I, I, I do reduce students when I start often to saying, here is one primary source and I just want your opinion about it. Um, to, to break them out of the habit of looking for a narrative. Um, but I, I think what you're asking is what comes right after that, right? If they just say, well, here's my opinion about it, I'm done. That's not how historians construct arguments, per se. And I, I, I do think the um, thinking about what corroborates what you think. Um, the second question is, is sometimes more important than the first, right? So you have a source. They're going to read the source, and they're going to say, what do I think about this source? Fine, start with your opinion. Um, but then asking, why do you think that? What sources would you want to see? What else can you read that would make you feel more certain of that? Um, I noticed I was looking through some of the, the material you have, the questions about what sources do you trust? Um, why would you trust one source over another, right? Which is sort of looking for that internal bias. Um, but corroboration of other sources and having them ask the question, how, what, how would I go about convincing myself more thoroughly of what I do think? Um, or if somebody said, well, I don't believe you, it's just your opinion, what else can you add to back that up? Um, does that get at the question you're asking? Yeah. Okay, question I have. Uh, one of the... One of the things that we're discussing in this workshop is how to turn the student into the historian in the classroom as opposed to watching the teacher do history. Uh, we all sort of admit that the, that the DNA of history teacher is kind of lecturer, you know, and that's kind of the way a lot of us were taught, and we gravitate to that. I've, I've done it myself through certainly the early part of my career. So with that as a background, I guess it's a... It's a two-part question. One is, do you find that your students at Marlboro come to you kind of out of this tradition of history as being lectured to? Is that the kind of student that you get? And secondly, depending on what the answer to number one is, how do you, how do you help them down that road to becoming the historian and not expecting to just sit there taking notes and writing papers? Um. So the answer to the first question is yes. Most of my students come from a lecture tradition. I would say every, I, I, would have, I have had two, maybe three students who have come in um, having read primary sources about something that they're really fascinated by, and it's usually uh, because they got hooked by something very small and very particular. So I had one student who came in from a small town here in Vermont whose friend worked at the Historical Society, and that particular town sent the highest number of people to the Civil War of any Vermont town, which is significant because Vermont, as a state, sent a higher percentage of its population than any of the northern states. So he had just seen all of these Civil War documents and gotten fascinated by those, and all of his narrative came after that. Um, but that is not most students. I, I agree, most students come from the, the, the lecture tradition. Um, the advantage that I have at Marlboro is that it's really small. Um, so my large intro classes will have maybe 15 people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's actually pretty easy to say, all right, we're looking at, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll take the example of the, the trader's letters. We're looking at economy and trade in the Mediterranean. Here are three different letters. You're going to break up into groups of five. Everybody's going to read a letter and think about what you know from reading that letter, and then we're going to talk about it. Um, like, we can do these exercises in class um, pretty effectively where I have a set of sources chosen around a topic, and, you know, one group can say, well, this letter implies this, this one thing, and I'm, I'm guessing that ships work this way based on this letter, but this other, other letter says something slightly different. So again, you get that question, what would you want another letter to say to corroborate one or the other of those, or how can you make those information accord? Um, 
So I spend a lot of time doing that sort of thing in class, most class time. And actually, when I started, class time was probably 50-50 lecture discussion. And now it's much more sort of 15% lecture. I have some lectures that I've built um, that I have on YouTube for them to watch. Um, if you watch them in order of the class, they cover... I made them over a two-year period. You can actually see me getting better at sound and video recording. The first ones are pretty bad, and the last ones are actually pretty good. Um, so it's, it's, you know, there's been improvement in that area. But now I lean much more heavily on here's a set of primary sources addressing a set of, of, um, a set of things that we want to learn. I spend a lot of time having them generate questions. So we read a primary source, and I say, well, what else do you want to know? What do you not know? Um, and so especially early on in the class, we'll spend 45, 50 minutes, a whole class session, just getting them to ask more and more questions. What do we not know? How would you answer this? What else do you want to know? Um, and I actually really like the exercise of just having students generate questions. Because, again, thinking like a historian, you just come up with question after question. Everything you read opens another question. Um, so that, in particular, I think is a good exercise for that. Uh, it looks like Paul has a Separate question, if it's all right, if I'll, I'll, I'll jump, to, oh, yeah. jump to Paul's. Um, he asks about language. Um, yes, language is huge, uh, especially doing medieval Europe. I rarely can have students reading it in the original, which I, <coughs> excuse me, um, which is a drawback. Um, I really wish that, that I had more students with really any language capacity. I mean, this is uh, whatever, I don't have to complain about foreign language education in the U.S. To, to all of you, I assume. Um, it turns out that my sources are actually not in Latin. The ones that I do my work on are in Old Catalan, um, which I had to learn to read. Although, as you say, most texts in the 14th century are probably still in Latin. I think it's probably a majority. 15th century, they're, they're in vernacular, uh, whatever country you're in. You know, but if somebody's done French or Spanish, I can have them read 14th century French or Spanish documents. Um, and it's, it's basically legible. You know, it's hard, and that's actually part of the interest, is having them try to read the handwriting, try to decipher the spelling is totally irregular. It's a little like reading Chaucer, right? I, I don't know if any of you have taught Chaucer in the original, but they can do it, it and the hurdle of trying to do it is part of what's interesting. Um, but yeah, all, all the texts that I use in my intro class are in translation. They've been prepared by somebody. Um, sometimes I'll have them buy a published set, depending on if there's a specific topic I want to get to that has a really good source collection that's been translated into English. Um, but yeah, that, that being a historian, the act of reading in a different language and translating it into my own is a big part of my experience that I actually don't have a good answer for how I translate that into my students' experience. Questions, Jen? Oh, uh, it's a question a little off mic here, but uh, have you had experience with the Library of Congress site? We're, we're, uh, that's part of our theme here. Um, a little bit. I, I teach a general research methods course, um, and I've used the Library of Congress there. Um, I think the, let's see, they have the American Memory Project, they have a, a primary source site, uh, they have a couple that are, that are sort of curated sets of primary sources. Um, in general, I think they're great. Um, they do a really good job. One of the things I like about the Library of Congress is that they do a good job of not just having text. Um, because another, th another thing that I feel like... Uh, I guess it's just, like you say, part of the atmosphere of doing history in the last 50 years, 100 years, is that texts are really king. Um, everybody reads texts, and I, I feel like it is a really good practice. American Studies tends to be better at this, and I think this is part of why the Library of Congress website is really good about this. It's really good to get them thinking in terms of the questions that you ask a text versus the questions that you would ask of an image or a painting or a sound recording, right? If it's World War I, you still have sound recordings and newsreels. Um, because the sorts of questions are historically are fundamentally similar, 
but you get different sorts of certainty and different sorts of knowledge about what's going on. I think painting, that's especially true of paintings, right? Art historians are a, are a separate subgroup for a reason because there are, are practices and standards in painting that make it a, a very different thing to read than a text. Um, and I like that the Library of Congress has a pretty wide variety of types of primary sources um, in its curation. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, the, the, the challenge that our teachers have that I, that I had was making history relevant to students. Now you're, now you're teaching in a very distant time, a very distant place, and I'm wondering if you use things like essential questions or any techniques to try and uh, uh, get students more engaged in studying medieval history. It, it's funny because medieval history, I think what I tend to use actually are gateway drugs. Medieval history, <laughs> the students who come to it who are really fascinated by it are almost invariably uh, fantasy fans. I, I get a lot of Tolkien fans, right? Like Tolkien is sort of a gateway drug to Middle English. Um, and I've now actually incorporated assignments into my history course. There's a really excellent essay by Umberto Eco, who is, is both a medieval historian and somebody who writes medieval fiction that is better known than his history, for sure. Um, but he has a great essay called Medievalisms that, that talks about the ways that the medieval past gets used in modern film and modern literature. Um, so uh, film is another one. I get lots of students who are, are fans of some form of, uh, you know, Crusader film or uh, whatever, Monty Python, right? There's a huge variety. The medieval world is really popular in film. Um, there are a lot of time periods that are. There's a, you know, genre of Roman film and whatnot. Um, but the students that I get usually have been hooked by some sort of, of modern media version of it. Um, and I, and I know other teachers, friends of mine, who teach courses specifically on medieval culture in modern media. Um, and that, uh, it, it's not exactly relevance, right? It's not the same thing that you're asking, I think, but it certainly gets people interested. <laughs> um, but, you know, the other, the other thing that comes up, the thing, some of the things that have gotten easier to teach... Um, doing Mediterranean history, Jewish-Christian Muslim relations. Um, Christian Muslim in particular in the last 15 years. Um, it's very easy to see how those, you know, th th those are questions that um, come up, they're questions that come up in the sources that they are familiar with from contemporary questions. Um, so in, in part, I do see areas that have become easier to teach because I don't have to address relevance as much. But I think my, like, you should be interested in this, tends to be a little more on the side of, here are things that you like that are fun. Um, now let's ask some questions. Uh, so, yeah, it's not, it's not exactly the essential question model, but I, I'm not opposed to that. I, you know, I'm... Okay. There's some a, some a other... Great, uh, Stanford has a course, Digging into Medieval History. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know if he's looked at that and if he goes through those same topics at different times. Okay. Uh, it's been asked, uh, Stanford has a course in digging into medieval manuscripts. Is that online. something, um, it's an online course, is that something you've uh, utilized or are uh, familiar with? I haven't. Is it, is it through the Stanford, is it one of their MOOC sites or is it, I haven't seen oh, it. It's a MOOC site. Ah, okay. But well, it's incredible, the videos great. are incredible. And the nice. Well, it's highly recommended so you get to learn great. something from us. Yeah. Send it to some, some other questions, because we're going to wrap this up in a little bit. Don, Don Anderson has a question here on the side, actually. Oh, okay. Sorry, he, it's been up there for a couple of minutes, so I, uh, I don't mean to put you off, but his wow. question is, is, a, is one that I run into a lot. Um, he, he writes, primary sources take a lot of time to digest. Uh, he talks about Charles Darwin, and Charles Darwin has 5,000 letters. So what do you do with that? Um, and I, you know, the really short answer is I, I don't have a good response to that. That is something that I feel like students develop 
especially from being freshman in college to senior year, is getting a handle on how much stuff there is out there, whatever they're doing. Um, you know, Darwin, Darwin has these thousands of letters. The, if anybody watched the video that I did on one of, of Francesco Dattini's letters, the Dattini archives have 108,000 letters from him and his business associates. Um, and, and I guess one of the things that I do is when I present my own work, when I talk about the sources that I used and the, the you know, my, writing my dissertation and writing articles, um, one of the things that I do impress on students is all of the material that I have not read about the thing that I am supposedly one of the like few specialists of in the world because there are very few people who study these like little concrete questions. Um, but I can list to you a much longer list of the sources and materials that I haven't read than the ones that I have. Um, so in, in part the problem never goes away and I think the earlier that students run into the idea that that uh, run into the idea of just how little they know about the past, that that might be enough. And I think that idea is certainly good for them. Um, I don't know, Don, if that sort of gets at it. But anyway, question in the back. My question was just that he's kind of flipped his classroom, and so he's put a lot of lecture online. But I'm curious, I mean, his lectures have changed over the years, and what he lectures. Okay. Uh, could you hear that? Uh, about the online lecture, if you repeat it. Well, I'll, I'll it repeat it. Uh, she's uh, asked if, uh, have, having put many of your lectures online, so, sort of having an archive, uh, how much your lecturing style has changed. Now, maybe not so much the, uh, the production quality, but the content. Okay, mm -hmm. so, not, so not so much the lighting and all that stuff, but just in terms of Seeing, seeing your style as a lecture evolve? Um, yeah, it's definitely... I mean, the main thing is that I've, I've added more questions into the later ones, right? I put in questions as I go and try to highlight the things that are not... Um, that I'm not certain about. The early lectures really have this quality of, like, here's the narrative, here's the beginning, here's the end, here's what I know, and here's what you need to know. Um, and the, the later lectures, I, I point up much more of the sort of flaws in the narrative or things that are being debated, things that I'm not sure about. Um, I have several now where the in-class assignment is to watch my lecture that gives a sort of vague introduction, but then I have five or six things that I want you to just go learn about and see what you can figure out, and they come back to class. Um, a good one is, is the 12th century Renaissance where there's a, a real renovation in the way that the, especially the Catholic Church does business. Um, church law changes in the 12th century. Theology changes a lot. Um, and there's several new monastic movements. Um, so I give a sort of basic overview for what's going on in the 12th century, but then I tell the students, you should go look into the Franciscans or the Dominicans or universities, which are, are something that appear in the 12th century. Um, and I have links to sets of sources. The Dominicans and the Franciscans are really easy because you can read their foundational documents and writings by St. Francis himself in particular. Um, those are, you know, there's good translations that are easily available. Um, but I tell them to pick one of those subparts and then come back and have a discussion about that. And so the lecture doesn't feel as complete as it did when I started. Um, yeah, and I'm, I mean, I, I am most struck by the production quality. The other thing that the other comment I would make about the recorded lectures in particular is that um, I don't have as much time as I would want to go back and remake all the ones that I think should be remade. Um, I, I often will teach a class and think, oh, I should change this lecture for next year. I should change these four lectures, and I, I maybe will change one of them. Um, and that's just a matter of you know how much time I have. Although one of the solutions to that actually, and I have. A, this is a slight tangent to your question, but I think it's important. Um, I assign a lot of lectures by different people. So I will often assign one by me as well as some by someone uh, lecture by somebody else, um, even if it contradicts what I've said. And I, I like the students to experience the polyvocalness of what we know, to, to hear from different individuals and get kind of a different story for the same time period. Um, again, it highlights that. That, that fact that we're not totally certain about these things and that 
you know, one educated person's understanding of it um, can contrast with other people. So. Great. Any other questions? Then I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, Adam, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I, I speak for the group. I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that even though most of us are history teachers, we've never met a real live historian. <laughs> so this is fun. And what I think is most exciting is that you seem to be having so much fun being a historian, which uh, speaks well. So uh, just to follow up, you mentioned some of your lectures. Are they on your YouTube channel? Yes, they should all be on the YouTube channel. Great. So I will add those to the footnotes of this. Uh, this will be available on YouTube so we can all go watch later on. So again, okay. thank you very, very much, Adam. Let's all give him a wave. Okay, again. Thank you. It was really fun. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.